morning. So we have any uh, kids going down to the nursery? John, Joseph. Um, it's part of the deal. You're a pastor's kid. Like, uh, you get to use the church to entertain your friends sometimes, but you also get ridiculed from the pulpit. It's just part of the deal. Um, oh, man. So Dan's prayer this morning and his teaching on, oh, man. No, because once I get going, I'm going this morning. Let's, Ken, Ken's got some, he wants to talk about something very important, which is alabaster. So we are a global church, Church of the Nazarene, and we are tasked with taking the gospel to the nations, and part of that is what we do through alabaster, and Ken is going to talk about that this morning. Good morning. As the pastor said, my name is Ken, Ken Bartels, and just want to let you know that the church is alive and well, and the Holy Spirit is here among us all today and forever and ever. What I'm here for is I am the, well, I guess they call it the president of the Nazarene Missions International that represents our church here in New Life. And I'm talking about uh, the alabaster, and in the back you'll see some boxes that are like this. This is the for alabaster collection, and what the funds do is it, uh, the funds go to all over the world to help new churches, old churches, the ministry that is within the Nazarene Church, and it helps them to build new buildings, renovate old buildings, and it helps with the missionaries that are out in the world for us. And it's an overflow of hearts filled with gratitude for God for his wonderful gift to us. Now, the story about the alabaster, basically, I'm going to give you a little short information about the alabaster box and what it represents. Actually, back in uh, the late 1940s, a lady uh, started the alabaster collection within the churches. And she uh, passed away in 1990, or I'm sorry, in 2000, and she was uh, 91 years old. And she spent her whole life working with the alabaster offerings. In the Bible, in Matthew 26, 6 through 13, it, there was a message in there. It says, while Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon, Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reaching the table, as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And through history uh, and a little research, uh, it is attributed that they, they believe that the woman that did this was uh, Mary Magdalene. There's nothing that is documented proof. There's a lot of research in this. And so her life was changed from a terrible life of sin and accepted Jesus Christ. So this offering here is in addition to any monies that we give to support our church here in New Life. This 100% goes directly to the missions for alabaster. So 
There are some boxes in the back there. You can pick these up. Next Sunday will be Alabaster Sunday, and you can bring your offerings in these boxes. If you don't have a box, there's a, there's a container back there that you can put the offerings for Alabaster, or if you write a check, be sure to put on there that is for Alabaster if that's what you want it to be. Thank you very much for your time. You have a great day. Thank you, Ken. So, yeah, so just to add a little bit to that, so Alabaster goes to build churches, orphanages, schools, parsonages. Um, many pastors throughout the world don't have the luxury of the salary I receive, and, and, you know, a lot of times the only compensation they might get is a place to live, and they wouldn't have a place to live otherwise. So we're building churches. We just helped build a church in Pakistan. We're building parsonages, schools, orphanages. So this is a good work that the Lord is doing. Um, yeah, where was I? So Dan talked about Charles Spurgeon. He talked about exhaling, inhaling and exhaling and, and Bible study and prayer. And it's, you know, we're a church that believes that all the law and prophets can be summed up in two commandments. Love, honor God with everything you have. And, and, and Bible study and prayer is a big part of that. It just, if you want to know and honor God, you kind of have to go where he is, right? And then the second commandment like it is to love your neighbor as yourself. So, so we kind of believe two things, that we need to be where God is, experience his presence, allow him to transform us. And Jesus says he's going to make us fishers of men. And if we want to be fishers of men, we've got to go where the fish are. So we want to go where we find God in prayer and Bible setting. We want to go where the fish are, which is outside of these walls. Anyway, that's not part of my sermon. Um, but I just thought it was timely. So I feel like I'm becoming a local here at the lake, and it's taken longer than I wanted. But I, I've caught myself saying, I'm glad bike week is over. Uh, I don't know if I'm the only one. And I'm grateful that they come and they spend money and and. Bless their hearts. Uh, we're grateful, but I'm also glad to just have our roads back. Um, and this is kind of my favorite time of year. It's The temperature is amazing, right? Amen. Amen. For those of us that, that, if it was about 10 degrees cooler, that would be God's ultimate favor on us, right? 45 in the morning, 65 in the evening, it is perfect. And we're getting there, Yes. I don't know Anthony's being honest or he's being a suck-up, one of the two. Uh, <laughs> uh, hey, well, also, college football is in full swing. Yeah. Mizzou had a great win yesterday against Kansas State. 61-yard field goal, its time expires. That was amazing if you're a Mizzou fan. For us, us Arkansas folks, Kalen and myself, was a much harder day. We kind of choked against BYU. Um, I don't know why, but BYU's a Mormon school, so I just think about them beating us in, like, their shirts and ties, you know? Uh, but, hey, no, they're the, they are the best fans in the world. So we played Arkansas at, in Utah last year, and we beat them handily, and their fans were buying our fans dinner afterwards. Then they came to Fayetteville this year and returned the favor, unfortunately, but not only did that, but their alumni association goes to every game, away game, and they find a homeless shelter, and they supply it for three months. Isn't that amazing? That was amazing. So I don't know if that made the, the butt kicking any better, but um, at least homeless are going to eat for three months. But I love college football. Like, you guys go crazy about the Chiefs, and I love the NFL. I like the NFL, but I love college football. So I grew up in Arkansas, and all we have is the Razorbacks. We have Arkansas State, if you went to school there. Yeah, yeah. if you went to school there or you had kids that went to school there, you root for Arkansas State. If you're normal, you root for the Hogs. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're an Arkansas family, and I grew up just diehard. My dad was a diehard Razorback. Um, and my voice is cracking. I get emotional over this, but... Um, but not really. Um, 
there's, there's three stories that are tied to like kind of Arkansas football that are pretty memorable for me. And it's, they're very nostalgic. And I kind of, during this time of year, I, I think about them and kind of three different seasons in my life. And I'll kind of start at the most recent. I think I was probably 21 years old. Oh, I don't know. I was 21 or 22. And then, so I, I took my little brother, Josh, who's 10 years younger than me. So he's 11 or 12, maybe to a game, and we took my dad with us. This is the last Arkansas game I went to with my dad before he passed. Uh, and I, I wish this was a better story, but it's funny. Um, so we went, and Josh is, uh, he's 11 or 12, right? Just an 11-year-old kid. Um, and we are at the game, and there's thousands of people, and we're at War Memorial Stadium in Little Rock, and we're walking around. And, and my dad says, to, and if you've never heard me talk about my dad, so... My dad was a wonderful man, but he, he's a little bit of a hillbilly, kind of backwoods a little bit. Uh, not a redneck, but just had this like very southern, simple way. And he was, so he was an alcoholic and he'd been drinking and uh, he, he had to go to the bathroom. So he said, boys, I got to go pee. I said, all right, cool, dad. Thanks for sharing. And uh, so when Josh and I are standing there, we're waiting to go into the stadium. I thought he's going to find a port john or something. And uh, I hear Josh say, Jason. And I turn around. I say, what's, what, what? He's like, look at dad. <laughs> there is my dad up against a wall peeing in public. <laughs> that was my dad. <laughs> It's just what he was used to. He lived out in the country. He's like, why not? No one can see me. And we're like, everyone can see you. <laughs> they may not see you, but they see you. <laughs> and Josh was mortified. And at this point, like, I kind of had some sense of the humanity of my parents, right? Like, they're flawed, and we all are. But Josh is 11, and he is just like, oh, my goodness. This is the most embarrassing thing ever. Go back to when I was 16 or 17, and this was gosh, one of the highlights of, of my young life, but uh, I took a, a buddy of mine, and we went to the game in Little Rock, and, and we drove up there together, and I kind of had established this tradition. I had figured out how to kind of finagle my way at the end of the game over by a tunnel where the players came in and out, and I, the friend I took with me was one of these kids that followed every rule to the T. I don't know if you know this about me, but that is not me. Uh, I, I was very comfortable in any sort of gray area, and, and if it was black or white, I could make it look gray. Um, so I said, hey, let's go. You want to go down in the tunnel and meet the players after the game? He's like, how are we going to do that? I'm like, well, we just got to go down through. We got to get sneak through a couple gates, and we'll be able to get over there. And he's like, oh, I don't know about this. I'm like, come on, man. It'll be fine. We're not going to get in trouble. Don't worry about it. That's a bad influence. Um, but we went and we snuck through one gate, no problem. And, and I'd done this a few times. But I look back at him and, like, the panic on his face was like we were trying to rob Fort Knox or a casino. <laughs> he acted like we were about to go to prison for 30 years if we got caught. And we get to the next gate and there's security people there. And I was not expecting this. Luckily, I'm quick on my feet. I'm a salesman. Um, and I go, and there's a lady there. And, and you know, I, I kind of rationalize she's probably a mom. So I'm going to play this like I'm only a kid bit, right? And she, she's like, what are you boys doing? I said, oh, we're just trying to get over here to the tunnel. She's like, well, how'd you get, how'd you get here? I'm like, yeah, we just kind of wandered our way through there. And I said, are we, are we not supposed to do that? And she's like, no, you're not. I said, and she's like, I'm like, well, we just want to go over here to the tunnel. And she said, no, I can't let you do that. I said, come on, ma'am. I said, we drove up here. We spent our own money. We drove from an hour and a half away. Please. And I, in my mind, I'm saying, please, mom. And, and she said, oh, you're lucky I have a son your age. And so she lets us go in, and um, we get on the, on the tunnel, and we're kind of leaning over, and the game's kind of coming to an end. We're tied. And if you're an Arkansas fan, there's a name, Frank Broyles. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He was Arkansas coach for a long time. He won a national championship. Then he was the athletic director forever. But I saw him walk on the field. And I, I, I had to shoot my shot, right? I say, Coach Broyles. And I get his attention, and he turns around. And I say, can we come on the field with you? 
And my friend looks at me like I am crazy. He's like, you're going to get us kicked out of here. I'm going to have to call my parents. They didn't want me to go with you anyway. Uh, but he does the unthinkable, and he says, yeah, come on down. He, we jump over. I jumped over quick. He jumped over slowly. And when we get over, security kind of swarms on us because they didn't catch the exchange. They think we're going to run on the field streaking or something. I don't know what they thought. But, but Coach Broyles is like, no, 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 they're with me. And then we go out there, and we watch the game. It was a six-overtime game. We watched on the field with the greatest legend in Arkansas football history. And it was this amazing moment, and it kind of summed up the joy that was my teenage years. And there's one other one. I was 10 or 11 years old. Went with my dad to an Arkansas game at War Memorial Stadium, and we were outside, and you know, I was kind of taking in the sights. There's food, there's people, there's everywhere, like it's, it's crowded. And I'm kind of lost, you know, I'm dazed and just like this, this was like church for me growing up. And I turned around and I looked up and my dad wasn't there. I thought he had left me. And there's all these people around, but I can't see my dad. And I say, where are you, dad? And I'm thinking this to myself and it felt like 20 minutes. But I did the rational thing, right? I decided to take off running because that's probably what he did. So I took, I said, I'm going to run around the stadium at full speed, and I think I'm probably going to see him that way. So I take off, and I run around the entire stadium, and I don't see him amongst the 50,000 people. I get back to the gate we were standing at. I don't go all the way back because I was like, well, I haven't seen him. What probably happened was he's walking the same direction as me, so I'm going to just take off and go the other way at a full sprint, and we'll probably cross paths. We did not cross paths. So I get back, and finally I see my dad standing there, and I'm mad. I'm like, where were you? You abandoned me. And he's like, no, we told you we were going to go over here and get a hot dog right there. We were standing there when you took off. We didn't know why you took off. And then he said, hey, his friend... Ricky was there, and he said, yeah, we saw you running towards us, and then you turned around and ran the other way. (laughs) And he said, why didn't you just wait right there? You knew where I was, and I would be able to find you. And I said, oh, man. I did not discern where I should wait there. And, you know, those are three seasons of my life, and that was the first. I realized I'd kind of taken my my dad's provision for granted that he had my best interests at heart, and in a moment I kind of questioned him. And we have those seasons in our lives, right? We have those seasons that um, people take care of us, and we may, not, we may not acknowledge it or understand it at the time. And we have those seasons of joy, and we have those seasons of embarrassment, maybe about the things that we've done or people we know have done, and we have seasons where we feel abandoned, if we're honest. And... and There's a season for everything in life, though, right? There is a season for everything in life. And we go through all of these different emotions and these seasons. And the Bible talks about that. In Ecclesiastes 3.1, this is a famous passage, a lot of funerals. There is a season, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And I'm going to read this list here. But as I do, I want you to make a mental note of how much of this you have experienced. Close your eyes if you need to, but just think about this list. So there is a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. There is a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time 
for peace. Most of us have experienced most of these things on this list, right? If we're older, we may have experienced even more of them. But most of us have experienced much of what is on this list. And we can all acknowledge that there are seasons in life, right? We all acknowledge that? That's not rhetorical. I want to make sure we're on the same page. Still, we all acknowledge that? And, oh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> there are physical seasons, right? We have winter, the best, followed by spring, summer, and fall. We have those four seasons. Now, probably spring, fall, winter, then summer is how I would rank them. But uh, we also have seasons in our development. We have seasons in the womb, right? We're in the womb, and then we're an infant. And then we're a toddler and a child and an adolescent. For me, I call that season stupid. Um, and then we have, like, we're a young adult, and then we're an adult. We're an adult. And then we're middle age, which we call like 50 to 60, which is totally untrue. Nobody 60 years old is middle age. No one here is living to 120. Ray's not here, so I'm pretty comfortable with the rest of you. But 60 is not middle age, and then we get old. And the older you get, the older old gets, right? <laughs> I've realized that. I'm 42. When I was 30, I thought 50 was old. Now I think 70. I'm like, oh, that's not old. 70 is not old. <laughs> Praise God. That's right. <laughs> and, I, and I just, I, I think that as we get, I, in my mind, I think that like someone that's 75 now isn't the same as someone that was 75 when I was a kid. And that's not true. I'm just older. And I just, I understand that they're people and, and not ancient. So, but we get old and then we die, right? We have these seasons of our development. And, and we have seasons of health and seasons of sickness. We have seasons of excess and seasons of lack. We have seasons in life. But did you know there are spiritual seasons as well? There are spiritual seasons in our life. Absolutely there are. And we probably know that to some extent. In some ways we comprehend that. In fact, a lot of times we can see the hand of God on these seasons. We can, and many of you do, after the fact, right? How many of us look back and say, oh, I see what God was doing there. I see, well, yeah, yeah, one or two of us, right? But in the moment, we don't a lot of times. Some of you may. But some of us don't. And, and, and have you ever looked back and said that? I just, I, oh, I didn't understand it, but I see what God was doing. Because hindsight's twenty twenty, right? But how much better would it be if we could actually discern the spiritual season of our life when we were in it? How much better would that be for us? How much better would that be for our country and our community and the kingdom of God? It would be so much better. You know, I don't know if, well, Marie watches The Office and my kids. I don't know if anyone else does. But so there's this moment kind of at the end of The Office and one character is kind of reflecting on it. It's Andy Bernard. And he says, I wish you could know what the good old days were when you were in them. And isn't that so true? Wouldn't it be great if we could discern the spiritual season of our life when we were actually in it? But it's so important for us to discern that season while we're in it. It is so important. And why is that? Have any of you ever been so stressed out by the future or burdened by the past that you miss large chunks of your life? Most of us, right? Right? We are so worried about what we can't control in the future or what's just way behind us that we can't be present and discern what is happening right before our eyes. I have done this so many times. And it's so important that we realize that we have to discern the spiritual season we are in. We can live most of our life and not really experience much of this life that we were called to. And what does it mean to discern the season? Does it mean to know something? 
I'd say no. Or I'd say partially. But you, just think about this. Let's say you, um, all your life you've wanted to go skiing in Breckenridge or Colorado, wherever, the Rocky Mountains, and, and say you, you're looking on your phone and you see this great deal come along. Really good deal on a hotel, and they're going to throw in a, a free lift ticket, and you're going to go skiing. And you're like, wow, I cannot pass this up. You run home, get all your stuff together, you buy yourself all the gear, you get the goggles, get your plane ticket booked, you go, get out of your hotel, you get on the lift, you come down, you hit the ground, and you fall flat. And then someone comes behind you on a track bicycle and runs you over. Because it's July, and he discerned the ski season, and he's on a bicycle, and you're on skis. And he knew, they both knew, that people ski in Breckenridge, right? They both knew there are mountains there. He knew you needed gear. He knew you needed a lift ticket. He knew where Colorado was. But he didn't discern the season. And I know this is extreme, and hopefully none of us would do that. We're in trouble. But one guy discerned the season and one guy didn't. They had the same knowledge, but not the same discernment. So discernment doesn't mean to know. Discernment means to understand. And some of us can discern the physical things of this world. Some of you can discern the stock market. Some of you can discern... The, the, the health of the human body. Some of you are nurses or doctors or there's several of you in here. Um, financial advisor. You can discern the things. You understand them that most people don't. But here's the problem, though. We don't take time to discern the spiritual things in our lives. And Jesus talks about this in Luke 12. He says... Verse 54, Jesus says, Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, that There will, there will be hot weather. And there is. And then he says, Hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? How do you not discern this spiritual time that we're in? They could understand the weather patterns, but they could not understand who was right before their eyes. They knew the law and the prophets. They knew the past. They knew the prophecies about Jesus. They knew that the Messiah is coming, but they missed him in their midst because they could not discern the times spiritually. And so many times we know what is behind us and we worry about what is in the future, but we miss what God is doing in our midst. And this is so true of the body of Christ, both individually and spiritually. And, and let me ask you this. What is the hardest time to discern God's presence and His plan and His purpose in our lives? Is it when things are good or when they're terrible? I know, I think it, it feels like when things are terrible. It feels like when I'm in the wilderness. But I don't think that's always true for us. And just hear me out. When things are really, really good, like a season of blessings, a season of rain, God pours down, everything I touch turns to gold. In those moments, I don't need to acknowledge God's presence. I don't need to discern his purpose for my life. I'm just praying, Lord, keep the good times coming. What I should be doing is saying, God, you've blessed me. I'm born in America. I am a white male of average intelligence in 2023. This is a blessing, and what do you want from it? What do you want to do in me? What do you want to do through me? And what do you want me to do for your kingdom? But so many times in these seasons of blessing, we'll come to church and we'll acknowledge his existence, but we don't discern what he has for us in that moment. 
And then we get to the wilderness season. And we're so used to being distanced from him, distanced from him. We can't find him. We don't know how to get back to him. And we need to acknowledge, we want to feel his presence. Oh God, I need you. I don't know if you've ever had the feeling, where are you, God? Because I feel abandoned. And we don't think about, oh, we didn't think about that in the season of blessings, but now we're in the wilderness and it's painful and it's lonely. And it's very hard for us to say in that season, what is your purpose for this, God? What do you want to do in me? What do you want to do through me? And how do you want to build the kingdom? And many of you are experiencing times of blessings. And many of you are in a season of wilderness. But you've got to discern it always. Because whatever God is doing, He is doing for His purpose. He is doing for your good. Wilderness or blessings, He is doing it for your good, but He is doing it for His purposes. So we must, must, must fight the temptation when things are good. And cry out to Jesus and say, Lord, you've blessed me with all of this. What are you trying to do in me? How are you trying to change me? What do you want to do through me, God? What is my place in your kingdom in this season of blessings? And when you do that, when you get to the wilderness, it's going to be so much easier to say, God, I know you were there in the season of blessings. Teach me in this wilderness season what you're trying to do in me. What you want to do through me? How can we build your kingdom? Teach me, Lord. And it affects the posture of the church in general. I, I, I think we have failed to understand or discern the seasons that we are in culturally. And here's what I mean. If we look... And we talk about this youngest generation among us. And we are quick to say that we are, are, are facing an identity crisis in our youngest generation. And that we're going to say that manifests in this LGBTQ lifestyle. We kind of lump everything in there. But we say, like, there's an identity crisis in our youth. And that's true. It's true. And we have that knowledge. But the way we engage it is flawed because we haven't understood. We don't understand the times that we are going through. We don't understand the culture. And why is that? Because you have an identity crisis as well. Because your generation had an identity crisis as well. And you didn't discern it. And we don't know how to deal with what's in front of us. We had knowledge. We had knowledge in the 70s that things were going terrible, that interest rates were going through the roof, that gas prices were getting high, that that all of these things were happening. It's true. And now we have this, this group of people, and they might say, like, I'm a gay Christian or a transgender Christian, and stay with me. Or they would say, like, I'm same-sex attracted Christian, or I am whatever Christian. And we will say rightfully, no, your foundation is in Christ alone. That is who you are. That is what forms you. But let me go back to the 80s. In response to the culture, Ronald Reagan was elected. And we had this groundswell of what? Conservative Christianity. And this was from good intentions. There's a crisis in the culture. But can you see what putting that conservative before the Christianity has done to the church? We have, you see, when we have to make a hard choice, when we vote, we have to make a hard choice. When, we, when like Jerry Falwell, the moral, moral majority first came out, like we were going to let godly men, the best that we knew how, right? We were going to let godly men and women. We were a 
of people, conservative Christians, family values, all of these things that are good. But we lost that, didn't we? And if you saw the news, Lauren Boebert is a conservative, conservative Christian politician in, in Colorado, and she had an affair on her husband, divorced her husband. Two weeks later, she's at a, a rally with... Anyway, a, a, a false prophet of a worship leader. And then now she's in... A, a, comedy club or a play and, and being groped and vaping and, and doing all of these things. And, and, and what's going to happen is the conservative Christians are going to say, like, no, 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 that's okay as long as she supports these policies. Do you know why? Because conservative is our identity before Christian. I, 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 I fight the battle. But what you do says what you're grounded in. It says what your faith is founded in. So if I have to say, like, oh, you know what? I'm not going to vote for someone who is a, an adulterer. Like, they're human. I will pray for them. I will love them. But I'm not going to vote for them because I'm a Christian. And that matters. I'm a Christian who is conservative. I am not a conservative Christian. I can't be a liberal Christian. I am a Christian, and that is where my identity is. And I have to discern the current culture through that lens. What does Jesus say? That's all that matters. So I can be a Christian who is conservative. And you're not going to like me on this. I can be a Christian who is not conservative politically. I can be either one if I am founded in Christ because it is going to affect everything I do. And we are going to disagree. We are going to disagree. And, and, and I might say, oh, wow, how can you be a Christian and vote for someone that's pro-choice and vote for someone that doesn't want to define marriage traditionally and vote for someone who does this or this or this? How can you condone all that sin? Or I could say, how can you be a Christian who calls people illegal? How can you be a Christian who lives in excess? How can you be a Christian who does all these things? You see, if what comes before Christian defines us, we have not discerned the season properly. And that is where we are at the church, as the church. And I believe that God is doing something incredible. I believe he is doing something incredible. And I'm not bashing you, I'm preaching to myself. But it is time for the church to change its mind, to repent and follow Jesus and discern the spiritual season that we are in. Because if we don't discern that spiritual season, we cannot be effective and we're going to lose everything to the enemy and to the world. It's happening. It's going to continue to happen. What can we do to discern the season of your life? And this is individually and this is at the church. And I'm going to talk about in the next two weeks being in the wilderness season. Being in a season of blessing, how we deal with that, how we respond to those seasons. But what I want to get right now is how do we discern the spiritual season that we're in individually? How do I discern the season Amy or I are in in our marriage or as a father or as someone who loves young people and wants to pastor them well? How do I discern where we're at? I, I think I have a good place to start for you. This is simple. This is the gospel. Repent. Repent, which means change your mind and follow Jesus. If we start here, you can't start anywhere else. you got to say, you know what, God? I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but it feels like something. I'm going to say, you know what? I want to repent. I want to change my, right, my, my mind 
right now, and I just want to follow Jesus. That is the first step. That's the gospel message. Change your mind and follow Jesus. The kingdom of God has come near. That's simple. It's not simple, but it's simple. The second thing, practice presence. Seek him where he is found and listen. Here's what we want to do. Rather than discern, we want to know and then act. This is what I want to do anyway. I want to know something and then act on it. If you tell me something, I want to do something about it. It just got me in trouble so much in my marriage. Amy tells me something and I want to fix it. And I may even say, well, what do you want me to do about it? That's not the right answer. What she's saying is I just want you to listen because you're my person. But I say, no, you tell me you better want me to do something. And that's kind of how I can treat my relationship with God. I know something and I want to do something. But we have to practice presence. We have to seek him where he is found. And that is prayer. That is his word. I cannot tell you how powerful. If you pray and you read his word, he will speak. And then we have to listen. And I know this is Christianity 101, but I don't want to make it transactional. It is what's good for you. Be where he is. His word, his spirit is within us. Prayer. But here's the key. Listen. Sometimes we can say, hey, God, I'm gone. Bless me on the way. Better have my back. But listen. There's this old expression, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Sometimes you have to slow down and hear the voice of God and things are going to happen so much quicker in your life. If you slow down, you seek him where he is, you sit in his presence and you listen. You know, Mother Teresa said, Dan, Dan Rather was interviewing her and she, and she was talking about how she, she can be in prayer for, well, I don't remember what it was, six or eight hours a day. And he's like, well, what do you do and during that time? What do you say? She says, well, mostly I just listen. And then he said, well, what does God say? What does he do? And she says, mostly he just listens. And we just sit there in each other's presence and he speaks somehow. That is what's transcendent about God, to just be in his presence, to practice presence. Number three, experience the eternal kingdom of God in the present moment. I know that may not make a lot of sense. So here's C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Screw Tape Letters. If you haven't read it, a lot of times he speaks from the, the enemy, the evil one. He's kind of writing from that perspective in this band of, of evil. And he says in there, and this is speaking from the enemy's perspective. So he's calling God the enemy in here. And he says, the humans live in time, but our enemy, who is God, destines them to eternity. He therefore, I believe, wants them to attend Chiefly to two things, to eternity itself and to that point of time which they call the present. For the present is the point at which time touches eternity. Think about that. The present is the only place that time touches eternity. And he says, of the present moment, And of it only, humans have an experience analogous to the experience which our enemy, God, has a a, a reality of whole. So only in that present moment, in the will of God, can we experience the eternal which God sees all the time. That's the only moment where eternity crosses time. And he says... In it alone, freedom 
and actuality are offered to them. And you think about that. How much freedom is there in the past? How much freedom is there in the future? None. And we spend so much of our time running to the past, back to those chains, or dwelling on the future, to those chains we can't wait to get into. But we have an opportunity to experience the eternal kingdom of God now in His presence. How powerful is that? That's really all I got. Um, But I just want to ask you, and I'm closing, how much time do you spend discerning the the, the present spiritual season in your lives? I know how much of a challenge it is for me. You know, my boys are growing up, and you can't help but kind of look back, and sometimes nostalgically, sometimes with regret. I wish you would have done things different, proud of some things you did. John thinks I should have been more strict. Only kid on the planet that thinks his dad should have been more strict. Um, Joseph probably doesn't agree. Uh, but you spend time in the past, and then I'm thinking about what, what's the church going to be doing in five years? What are Amy and I going to be doing a year from now when the boys are gone off to college? When are Drew and Lana going to have a baby? What can we do to prepare for that? How am I going to retire as a pastor? And it's chains. They are chains because we've all made mistakes. And there's pain coming down the pipe. But you are in this season of your life for a reason. And we owe it to God and to ourselves to discern what it is. So I'm just going to ask you to make a commitment I won't know if you do. I will know if if you do it or not. The Lord will tell me. But um, change your mind. Repent and just say, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm tired of this other stuff. I'm tired of my past owning me. And I'm tired of worrying about the future. And I'm tired of reacting to culture rather than discerning what God might want us to do about it. I'm tired. And God, I want to know what you're doing. And practice presence. Seek him where he is found. Pray, study his word. And this might feel like work. It has felt like work for me in the past. It has felt like work for me as a pastor. It might feel like work to me tomorrow. But I know I find him when I seek him. And I know where he is to be found. And just listen. You know, we all kind of figure out the the voice of God in our own head. He speaks to us all a little bit differently. But he will speak if you will listen. And just wait on him to speak. Wait on him to speak. Discern that season of your life. Some of us have 18-year-old kids. Some of us have grandkids and great-grandkids. Some of us have kids from 25 to 4. We call that season of their life stupid. Uh, No, Zeke's a blessing. You see him running around here. It's amazing. It's an amazing blessing for you guys and us. Um, But you were in a season of your life for a reason. And I believe God wants to work through this church, through this broken group, this broken family. Crazy uncles and annoying cousins. And where is Randy? Um... No, but, I, you know, I, I joke, but, oh, gosh, what a wonderful church. God is moving here. He is doing a new thing. And I believe he's calling us to discern the season of our lives and the life of our church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, you are so gracious to give us your Holy Spirit, which guides us, which empowers us to do the work you've called us to. So, God, I'm praying that you... Help us to discern the season you have us in. You know, I think about when you sent the Israelites into the the wilderness. And God, you provided manna. You provided what they needed. You may not have given them what they wanted. And you said their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't fade. 
God, help us to know that you're giving us what we need even if we feel like we're in the wilderness. But God, would you help us discern where we are, that we find you when we seek you. Might every brother and sister in this room find you in that secret place. Might they hear your voice. Might they feel your manifest presence in their lives. And God, would you show them, would you help them to discern how we might live in this current season? Because God, you are a good, good God. And we are thankful to be part of your plan. So for those who are downtrodden, I pray peace over their lives. I pray that your voice might be a voice of peace and hope and comfort. God, those of us that are apathetic, God, would your voice spur us to action? But, but God, would you teach us to listen first? Would you teach us to hear your voice and discern the season we are in for our good, but ultimately for your glory? We love you, Jesus, and we're so grateful to have a wonderful church to worship in freedom and a building and air conditioning and beautiful brothers and sisters who love us unconditionally, man, we are blessed beyond measure and we love you and we thank you for that in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I, I think all of heaven is smiling as your beautiful voices sing that. God does something in our, in, even in us that can't sing. When we sing out to him, it's this beautiful thing when we all come together. Hey, I want to thank you for supporting the ministry here financially. Two ways to give, offering box at the back, newlifeatthelake.com. We appreciate it. God is, is going to continue to do amazing things here, and, and you guys are kind of what makes it go. Uh, so we're grateful. And I'm going to bless you and send you on your way, and may the Lord bless you. Might, his, might he keep you, and would his face shine upon you. Go in peace and have a great week. Amen. Amen.